Wrapping up our series here on each of the individual warlord groupings, we have the outlaws, uh, Zhang Yan and Zheng Zhang. Now, in this video, we'll also be covering, go to him real quick, uh, Gong Sun Zan, because we did not quite cover him, and he's the last one, and I don't want to do a video just for him. But these two individuals have a very different play style, and um, I don't want to say they themselves play differently. I think they themselves, as far as their initial kind of outlook and how they play through their campaign, their first 15, 20 turns is going to be very similar depending on which one you choose. Um, and we'll go into that with each one of them, but we're going to start with uh, Zhang Yan, then go into uh, Zheng Zhang, uh, Zheng Zhang, sorry, and then finish off with Gong Sun Zan. But the Outlaws do have some really fun mechanics we'll go into with each one. Uh, they're not, they both do not play the same. Uh, Zheng Xiang has her own currency, and uh, Zhang Yan has uh, the ability to ambush attack whenever he attacks someone. So we'll uh, dive in here and have some fun here real quick. And here we are with our first one, Zhang Yan, and he has some fun mechanics here. Let's take a look at this big first one here, right? Yellow Turban factions are seen as outlaws, and diplomacy with them is normally restricted. Zhang Yan can improve relations with Yellow Turbans and can align himself with them. So we'll take a look at how that looks in the diplomacy a little bit later in this video, um, but it's really cool that with the outlaws, since they are outlaws, or with Zhang Yan in specific, uh, you can ally with the Yellow Turbans. In addition, he has can ambush when attacking. Now, if you've played Total War Warhammer 2, uh, and you've played the Skaven, you are familiar with their ability to, I think their stance is called stock, where anytime they engage in conflict on the map, it automatically is considered an ambush attack, and they have a chance for it either to succeed or not to succeed. Same thing here with Zhang Yan. Wait, Zhang Yan. Zhang Yan. There we go. <laughs> uh, Zhang Yan. <clears throat> so Zhang Yan has this ability to basically initiate an ambush anytime he just normally attacks people. In addition, he gets his uh, Black Mountain Marauders, Black Mountain Outlaws, and Black Mountain Hunters. Now these are basically upgraded versions, I wouldn't say of militia, but they're very strong uh, guerrilla units that you can recruit right out the gate. In addition to that, they scare things. They cause fear if you're going to think about things in a Total War Warhammer scenario. Now, one big important thing, it's really how you drive a lot of money to uh, Zhang Yan, is the Black Mountain Hideout. You can have this do one of three different um, endgames, and we'll talk about that when we look at the building browser. But <clears throat> as a whole, this outlaw plays very... I want to say he's got a lot of hit-and-run tactics built into him because he does have access to ambush right out the gate. So we'll attack here and see it'll say ambush succeeded. We're going to delegate. Uh, again, I always recommend make sure you do fight these battles, especially if it's an ambush. You'll win so quickly. Um, you can even see here that they delegated and we still lost 36 troops, which is kind of poopy, but uh, we will be just fine. So we'll move on forward. I'll go capture the lumberyard. As to be expected, and we'll delegate this one more time as well. This just kind of gets us to that typical location everyone will be. Now, with Zhang Yan, I would recommend looting and occupying, or, and actually I would even stress sacking and withdrawing for a lot of the situations you're going to be dealing with. Um, oh man, a Pyrrhic victory. That was a, that's a real kick in the nuts. In this situation, I would simply occupy, and I'll tell you why when we go into the building browser. But for every other settlement or, or commandery after this, I'm going to be looting, and occupying or sack and withdrawing, depending on the situation. situation. Support from the people has been established. And you know, the typical kind of turn one goodies here that we're going to be getting. Lead through all those. So we'll take a look here at First, the, the commander that, that Zhang Yan has access to. He's tucked away way back in the mountains. So, unlike uh, Zheng Zhang, who kind of starts a little further south, and with uh, Dong Zhuo right here, and uh, Han Sui over here, and uh, uh, Ma Tong over there, he actually is doesn't have any real native enemies. I mean, the closest one would be Liu Yu, but for the most part, you're not going to be dealing with it, that aggression around the gate because Gong Sun Zan is right here and he's going to be a dealing and he's going to be attacking uh Liu Yu or um uh Yuan Chuao as faster than you'll you'll get to uh, either one of those. So you have a lot of slow build up built into this campaign and I think that's what makes this of the two outlaws a little bit easier to deal with 
Um, especially the fact that, like I said, every time you get into a conflict, it is automatically going to be um, an ambush, or at least if you succeed. Uh, so let's take a look at the building browser real quick. The Black Mountain Hideout has got, you know, three kind of end game tier five, whatever you want to call these um, buildings. The Black Mountain Fortress, which is going to increase your post battle loot income and post or income from looting settlements. So those two things are going to be a huge driving force for your income as uh, Zhang Yan. In addition, also it increases your available armies too. So you'll get three available armies from this building, which is quite nice. Now, Black Mountain Sanctuary, this increases, increases your diplomatic relations with all Yellow Turban factions, and it gives you more spy positions. Uh, and lastly, Black Mountain Palace gives you more administrators, which is pretty cool, actually, and diplomatic relations with Han Empire factions. So you can really determine, uh, all these will give you the same static um, economic building construction reduction cost. So you can really build how you want to go about your campaign. In my experience, and this is totally anecdotal, this is not like the best way. I think the Black Mountain Fortress is the best route to go. Um, you can stack these to get even more benefits from them. Though so I would recommend every single commandery you do that you want to actually maintain should have a Black Mountain hideout to one of these three buildings. Um, I find this one to be really good. I would say seconded by this one. Having more administrator positions is going to be very beneficial for you because you'll be having you'll be you'll get access to three commanderies very quickly, and we're going to go through that in just a second here. But a lot of you guys always ask, like, how should I build out my commanderies per these warlords? Well, the GDP, as it were, um, that uh, Zhang Yan has high access to is green. Uh, everything that is peasantry income, so. Lumber yard, livestock farm, iron mine is commerce, but I think there's a tool maker I think was commerce as well. But there is a lot of, over in this region, there's a lot of peasantry income related things, and I think as well over here. Um, I don't have a map up. I'll, I'll post a map in the comment section that actually shows you where every single resource is across the entire map without you having to res uh, um uh, search it all out. So basically, you can plan where you want to expand to because you're going to go pursuing a certain resource and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll post that in the comment section so you can determine how you want to expand. But I would say, even just looking at this first commandery, I would stack um, the land surveying office so that you get food production. And food production is going to be critical with uh, Zhang Yan. In fact, either one of these will be, will, will be very food production heavy. You're going to need to really focus on it. And that's why getting that livestock farm is going to be very important. Um, in addition, I would also do your land develop. I'm sorry, government governmental support to increase your income from peasantry, because you're already going to be getting income from peasantry with your land surveying office. Um, you're going to be getting income from peasantry with your pine lumber yard. Um, same same thing over here with your livestock farm. I would do that with uh, Zhongshan. 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 Zhong... You guys will correct me. I'm sure. I try to do the best I can with pronunciations, and sometimes I totally butcher them. So I I apologize ahead of time. So that is how I would kind of initially play the first couple turns with Zhang Yan. Now, uh, my first target would be this Yellow Turban faction, followed quickly then by this town. Now, this town has a, um, defensive structures in it, so you're gonna your your army is gonna really lose a lot doing it. But as soon as you solidify this second commandery, you'll have two commanderies right out the gate, which is quite strong. Now. Uh, now, Zheng Zhang is right here, and she will take Taiyuan, and then she will kind of just sit there, and she'll sometimes take this building as well. I, I'm not really sure where that one is. Round. Usually when you go back, you can see this is a whole another Andri. Uh, oh, it's right there. This is going to be the, this is where the toolmaker is, I believe. So, yes, yes. Yes, yeah, that is right there. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, what I would do then is once I've taken uh, Zhang Shan, I would honestly just be aggressive and go right for Zheng Zhang. Zheng Zhang will betray you. It is going to happen it, unless you co nonstop, constantly like shower her with gifts and and try to marry her into your faction or just try to marry her to to, to um, kind of placate her. She is going to betray you. So you might as well be the one that betrays her. So before you go full balls out on, that sounds bad, but before you go full balls out on her, take uh, Taiyuan Iron Mine because this will be, this is going to be held by the, by the Han for a long time. 
for Zheng Zhang to get to it, she has to go across this mountain range and back down here. So, take advantage of that. Take this commandery, then take over uh, Taiyuan so that you have a lot of really good control in the mountains here. And then once you solidify Taiyuan, you'll have this huge mountain stronghold that you can always fall back to because you don't have you don't suffer any penalties in forests. Take a look at this. Um, enables ignore forest penalties. So that is really, really, really nice. Um, when your characters fight in actual combat, they're not going to have to deal with that at all. So it's quite well as well. Or it's quite great as well. The same thing with the Black Mountain Marauders. Where is it? Um, ignore forest penalties. So you get a lot of really strong benefits using the mountains to your advantage. You can do all of your hit and run stuff from up here. You don't have to expand out wildly and try and push into other regions uh, that you that you don't really think you should be at. I mean, you have guerrilla deployment with the mountain marauders as well. They're immune to fatigue. They're a very strong unit. They cause they scare things. They cause fear, um, and they're also raiders. So be mindful of that. Um, we're going to go ahead and end this turn so I can show you the recruitment pool for this guy. But, oh, and some of you guys were asking me this. Press options, character movement speed, press fast. AI movement display, press off, and then confirm. That's how I get my character to move across the campaign map so quickly. Um, a lot of you guys have asked that in the comments section, so that's how you fix that. <clears throat> but once you've really done that, you have, you have really snowballed. You're going to be have access to three whole commanderies with a really good deal of trade resources, a lot of income coming your way. Now, after that point, you're going to want to be aggressive in the fringes around the mountain. <clears throat> you don't necessarily need to expand. I'm, I apologize. My, my allergies are killing me today. Um, you don't need to expand into those commanderies. But necessarily what the good thing to do here is take advantage of your Black Mountain hideout. If you're Even if you just get to this building, that's 10% income from looting settlements. So go sack and withdraw a ton of uh, uh, commanderies and settlements all around where your new pre your new reestablished Black Mountain Empire is, your Mount Wutai Empire, because with those bonuses to your income loot or uh, yeah uh, income from loot, you get like five thousand, six thousand just from sacking and withdrawing, and you don't even have to take the the province and secure it. You can after the fact if you so wish, but um, the big thing is sacking and withdrawing and looting and occupying. To expand your your empire quickly because you'll get such a rampant amount of income that you can then push west i would say is probably the easier route because this is mainly han empire uh if you push east you're going to be pushing up against uh gong sun zan right here and yuan shuao and if it's the ai controlling these two they will typically get into a very vicious cock fight so getting in the way of that i wouldn't recommend you will get i think about turn six or uh, six to ten you'll get a little dialogue box that'll pop up <clears throat> and ask you, hey, do you want to betray Yuan Shuao or do you want to betray Zheng Zhang? Just, you, and you can choose to do, do neither. Depending on where you're at in this whole conquest of these two commanderies and Taiyuan's iron mine, do neither or betray Zheng Zhang. Don't, bother, don't even poke the bear over here. Don't expand into this direction until you are well secured financially or else you're just going to, you're going to suffer an uphill battle slogging against an established army down there um because he can he can recruit stuff so quickly in coalitions and all that jargon so oh sorry this isn't what i wanted to look at this is what i want to look at so with zhang yan or uh zhang yan we get access to black mountain marauders right um oh we have to actually get him to rank three before we can look at the other guys here but the black mountain outlaws will be accessed at rank three uh, rank six for heavy spear guards because he is a champion and then uh, rank five for the Black Mountain Hunters, which are, are really good archers. I don't think I have an archer unit to show you a comparison of. We'll do this. Kind of get them in here. Recruitment, military, archers. Oh, we can't do it. Dang. Oh, there we go. There we go. So you can see on the left and right, um, these guys, the... Archer Militia have 11 attack in combat. So the Black Mountain Archers are actually quite strong in combat. And that's the biggest way to shut down Archers is getting into their getting into their line and hurting them, right? They have way more health, way more uh, attack. Um, they're a lot better at just defending themselves. So that's what kind of makes these guys really nice in that their uh, upkeep is only 225, which isn't terrible. Um, and they do have guerrilla deployment. So you can kind of place these things out on the field, get a good advantage of where you want to be, and, and really, really take it to the enemy. And Zhang Yan himself is extremely strong in combat. I mean, these two, these dual axes, 
Uh, these ones don't do a whole ton of damage. Um, they're really great for starting out, but he's a really strong champion. So you have this ability to really threaten your opponent very strong and very heavily with this character as your champion. Um, also, Earth and Rampart is really nice because it gives him a nice 900% charge resistance to everything around him in a 50 meter range, which is quite nice as well. Unbreakable, um, ignore force penalties, blah, 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 immune to fatigue. Now, <clears throat> he also has his typical skill set that you would expect here. Um, he does have a lot of things that make him great as an administrator, shockingly enough. Like he's got... Uh, well, the abundance for one gets you a nice food production. Um, income from industry for intuition. It's really weird that he would make a 20% uh, income from peasantry. It's weird that he would make a good administrator, but I wouldn't really go that route. I would say keeping him on the, the road as a uh, aggressive character is probably the best way to go through go with things. Um, he also has this thing called patience, which gives him 25% chance of capturing enemy officers post battle. Also increases rate of wall element damage during sieges so you can get to this one you can capture your officers quite quickly i think he's got another one that does that as well but you want to kind of go for guile here that's going to increase your chance of ambushing by 25 percent that's going to increase the likelihood of you doing the auto ambush rather than them discovering it when you do attack them so it's not a guaranteed ambush remember that when you do attack them it's based off of the success chance of an ambush in the region. You get that by hovering over. Okay, right here, I've got a 100% success chance. Um, as far as reforms go, I would just strict stickly, strict stickly, stick rickly <laughs> to uh, the yeah, the green line again. Really focus on that that uh, income from peasantry. I believe this one's income from peasantry right there. This is all sources. So these two right there, that's going to be 25% bonus to your peasantry income. You can have that by turn 10. Um, I mean, this one will be nice, but getting silk and spice is not going to be a, uh, anything soon to be had. So you want to focus on stuff like this, which is, well, these are the, no, this is the lumberyard. Yeah. Nope. One of these is the lumberyard. Aha, there it is. But yeah, you want this one for the increased level four lumberyards, get increased income from your peasantry. Um, again, just focusing on what you've got. Livestock, lumber yards, iron mines, um, tool makers. Focus on those initial those initial commanderies and you'll be just fine as Zhang Yan. Before we switch over to Zheng, uh, Zheng Zhang, I want to finish one last thing with uh, Zhang Yan, which I keep messing up between Yan and Yan. Um, you can see here with this Yellow Turban Rebellion, which is right below us, uh, you know, you can do diplomatic relations with them, but in this case, they're disorganized rebels. They don't really have any cohesion. You can't do anything with these guys. Um, the other main factions, you can actually do a little bit of diplomacy with, but you can see there's nothing I can do with these guys. So that's why I was saying, just go for them, take them out. They're not going to do you any good at, at, at all. So knocking them out, you can only declare war on them anyway. So this is just to show you guys, which I said I would. How do you deal with um, the Yellow Turban Rebellion? Well, uh, you jump over your diplomacy, take a look at their kind of personality. If they're disorganized, they're organized. If it's the main faction, one of the three main factions of Yellow Turbans, you'll be able to deal with them. And just take a look at that. I mean, more often than not, you'll just be able to declare war and roll right through them. But again, take a look at this, this screen before you jump to uh, any of those big conflicts. We've already covered Zheng Xiang during our Warlord Currency uh, video, but she's worth just going over one more time to really flesh out how to play her um, in the initial portions of your campaign. And she is different, right? She doesn't have the typical kind of court system that even Zhang Yan has. Hers is very different. Bandit, outlaw, raider, bandit leader, bandit queen. And these are things that give her access to more things, more tribute and diplomacy and so on and so forth. But you've got your tribute hall. And you get your bandit lair, which is going to be quite important. I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, one thing to note about the Black Mountain hideout, which I did not go into, is that it does give you a lot of garrison units. And we'll talk about that here as well with uh, Zheng Jiang. Um, but you get her Fists of the Bandit Queen, as well as her Hidden Axes. Again, two really great axe infantry units that can do a lot of damage, just like uh, Zheng, Yan, or Zheng Yan's, but just a little bit different in their characteristics, I guess you could say. Now, she does have... Prestige through Infamy. Uh, she does give a lot of character experience. Um, satisfaction morale. Infamy decreases over time, as we've talked about. And her playstyle is, again, aggressive expansion. We've already kind of gone over how 
When you're playing her, you want to focus on as much replenishment as possible, as much mustering bonus as possible, because those two things are different. You want to make sure that you're constantly being able to be on the move and make aggressive movements out. Uh, Zhang Yan, you can really kind of be a little bit more passive because you don't have a currency that is going to degrade as you go through the game. Here, go ahead and do that. So, with Zhang Zhang, you really, really, really have to make sure you're putting the pedal to the metal, as they say. Go through this, close victory, give me some infamy. Um, we'll loot and occupy just for more infamy. Okay. Construction upgrade, as to be expected, we'll repair that. And repair that. Now, we did say with Zhang Yan that you should focus a lot on the green things, right? On on all of your food production. Now, with Zheng Zhang, you do have access to Ji He, Ji Ji He, I think it's Ji He, um, which is nice. You get access to a fishing port really fast, which is really strong because it gets you a lot of food production. And I believe a fishing port is commerce, from what I can remember. One of these is a grand fishing port, is income from commerce. And these two, the iron mine and the tool maker, are income from commerce as well. So, if you stack commerce in your first small town, um, it's not going to be a bad idea. Then when you go and take uh, Jihan, or Ji... You guys will help me, you guys will help me, I'm sorry. <laughs> as you take this commandery, you will also get access to a lot of food production. And, remember, just like I said for Zheng Yan, Zhe, yeah, Zheng Yan, you want to take him out as fast as you can. This will, again, increase that aggression playstyle that you're already kind of leaning towards anyway. So getting over there, smashing him out before he can expand down into these portions of the, the, the foothills of the mountain range are, are going to be advantageous for you. Because if you don't do that, like I said, he will betray you and you'll be on the defense of the entire time. And he's got a way more food production and he can supply a bigger army because of that. His replenishment's going to be up higher. His military supplies are going to be higher. The reserves in his town are going to be higher. Like, look at our reserves. It's eight. It sucks. So uh, that, that'll change as these things get repaired, though. So um, I would swap this building out right quick. Like, um, So you do have these two building lines. One, the Bandit Stronghold, which gives you 25% uh, income reduction by banditry and a 10% replenishment bonus. Cannot stress that replenishment enough. It enables you to get into far more conflicts and allows you to really expand faster. I, I, I really need you guys to focus on that. <laughs> um, then also, you get your Grand Tributary Palace, which increases tribute in diplomacy. So once you really get a massive army and you have a lot of you know world strength, I guess you could say, I think we'll be able to do it through this thing. You can request tribute. And this is obviously not going to work right now. Uh, he is a higher... There we go, a higher global strength rank than us. Ours is way lower. So you have to get your strength rank up really high. You have to have a big, strong army because they have to be scared of your army coming through and ravaging everything. If you, if you don't, what the hell are they going to be scared for? Because this will be a large determining factor of your income. You can see military strength and strategic situation is a positive factor here. But opinion of this idea is a negative 45. So as you either beat them to a pulp or... You're in a positive diplomatic situation with them, you can demand a tribute. Like if there's certain factions over here, um, Huan Sui is a, is one you could possibly get a positive um, a positive diplomatic relation with. But you're actually easier to do it over here with uh, Gong Sun Zan, uh, Yuan Chao, and uh, Liu Dai, Liu Dai, or whoever's in the Dai commander. I can't remember. Uh, Liu Yu, actually, I think it is. Uh, they're they're easier to get higher or better diplomatic relations with because as you destroy Zhang Yan, you're actually kind of helping them because you're destroying bandits, you're destroying Han Empire, Yellow Turban over here. So it's all kind of seen as a positive light to everything on this side of the mountain. So be mindful of that because your your uh, tribute doesn't need to come directly from people that you've beaten to a, a pulp. Now for your infamy, uh, as we've kind of gone over before, right now it's obviously inferior. No one's afraid of us. But as we go up, acknowledged, found, dreaded, all the way to legendary. So as you're at legendary, it's going to be harder to establish tribute and diplomacy 
via a positive diplomatic relation. You're going to have to usually do it because you're just that much stronger than them. But look at that 150% tribute in diplomacy, which will then stack with tribute hall, which adds an additional 30%. That's 180%. I think she gives also a passive in her uh, character profile, which we'll take a look at too. 50% um, tribute in diplomacy as well. So on your at your top end with just that building and max infamy, it's 230% tribute in diplomacy. That's massive. You can get so much from that. Now, of course, she does have a poor background, so you're going to be getting a reduced income from your family estates. Do that at 1.5k. This is the same as like Ma Tung. Um, also, she has minus one musterings, minus one mustering turns. So. Again, lending more into that, which I cannot, I, I'm just beating this dead horse now. Um, she needs to have that mustering per turn redu redu reduction, but you can really, really, really ramp up your army. So that means you're going to spend a lot of time in the red line. So let's take a look. <laughs> in the red line, go ahead and hit your NOS. Recruitment cost, oh man, we're, mustering, this is your big one. Minus two mustering turns, um, plus two starting ranks for peasant recruits, which is even better because you're going to have a lot of those to start out with. Um, replenishment, this is a good one as well. Retinue upkeep is strong because not having to pay your armies is very advantageous. There's another one here. Yeah, there's the other one. Is minus two mustering turns as well. So with this one and this one, plus hers, it's minus five mustering turns. Very, very, very strong. So take advantage of that. Really make sure that you're ramping up your reduction to, to mustering and to um and your increase your replenishment so that you can move from, from one location to the next. Because that's the only way you're going to build infamy, right? Uh, uh, uh. Uh, high infamy increases prestige, income from tributaries, and character satisfaction, but it will also worsen relations with other factions. Victories and settlement occupation options generate imp. So, go ahead and pull that out. Uh, making sure that you're loot and occupying as you go into these two territories. Yes, it will take them longer to kind of fall in line with you, but you'll get infamy from doing it. And anytime you see just a rogue faction out there walking around, you can go and attack it. Get yourself some, get you some infam infamy. So that is going to be your big focus with Zheng Xiang. Uh, we'll go take a look, we'll end this turn real quick, and we'll look at her recruitment pool. So you can look at her individual special units here. They're, they're pretty cool. I, I actually really like uh, Zheng Yan's a little bit more because they kind of replace your standard edition infantry. And he only needs to get rank three to get access to all of them. Now for her... You obviously get your heavy spear guards because she's again a champion. And she's very strong. She's a very, very strong champion. Her axes are way better than Zhang Yan's. She, of course, though, does not get the ability to ambush attack like Zhang Yan does. So be mindful of that. Um, she starts with Blind, uh, Binding Fury, which is just nice and nice. Uh, Fist of the Bandit Queen there, your medium axe infantry. Uh, so these guys are pretty well armored. They do a lot of damage, some good AP. They're really, really sick. I really like these guys. Range, damage, armor, piercing, ammunition. So they've got, because you can see their bows on their back right there. Um, I, I I forgot to mention that they are a, a hybrid unit. Just as medium axe infantry, but they do have bows. That is, of course, a great benefit. Um, oh, I thought it showed the other guys on here, but it doesn't. Ah, oh, hidden axes. There it is. Haha. -ha. Now your hidden axes as well are a uh, hybrid unit as well. Has range weapon. Now these guys, they all have stock, meaning that they are hidden no matter where they're at. Um, then they've got Snipe, meaning they can remain hidden while firing, making them even stronger, and they have Gorilla Deployment. So you can deploy these guys in advance, have them be in stock, and then snipe through all that, and they'll stay hidden the entire time. Then they can charge and do a crap ton of damage. They have a lot of health. 53k? I mean, take a look at that by comparison to G Militia. Way more than G Militia. So, really take advantage of having access to these guys on turn 1. They're not that expensive, but they're pretty damn expensive. 1609 is... It, it ain't too cheap. You can get quite a few other units, but at the same time, you're filling two roles with this, and that's what makes them, them so good and so important. You're getting archers, which are so strong in the early game, as you guys all well know, and you're getting access to axe infantry, um, which is also very potent in that early game. They can really crack open the nutshell pretty quickly. So take advantage of that, and you will have a way easier time with uh, Zheng Zheng, uh, Zheng Zheng. <clears throat> I'm taking a look to see if I missed anything here. Um, as far as oh, expansion goes, like I said, Take out Zhang Yan as fast as you can, because he's going to betray you, just like I mentioned. And then I would say shore up your first commandery and take over uh, Zhihan, Zhihi, as fast as you can, too, because then you'll have access to this fishing port. 
And again, you will solidify your mountain range empire. Both of these characters play very similar in that they both have to really knock each other out and <coughs> solidify, sorry, solidify that initial kind of mountaintop. But after that, sky's the limit. Go wherever you want. Uh, especially with Zheng Jiang, you've got all this Han Empire over here. You can expand down to this region um, and get yourself some horse pastures if you so wish. Um, that's mainly up in, yeah, in uh, Shofang. You'll be able to get them up there. But you can do a lot of looting. You can do a lot of aggression over here to increase your infamy. Use these flatlands as a, as a means to really drive that infamy up for you so that you can use it to increase your prestige and thus gain a higher faction rank. So I hope this helps you out with uh, Zheng Jiang here. Let's move on to our last warlord, and we'll kind of square off our video after that. All right, our last warlord. And this is, I think, the last warlord that I'll be going over. I think we've covered all of them now at this point is Gong Sun Zan, the Iron Fist General. And honestly, probably one of my favorite characters to play outside of uh, Sun Jian. Uh, Sun Jian is, of course, a little bit slower and a little bit easier to break into, but I feel the same thing is true for Gong Sun Zan. Let's go through his uh, unique mechanics, and we're going to do this a little bit differently than we normally do. We're going to go through the first couple turns like we usually do. Then I'm going to jump to my save, which I think is like turn 96, to talk about his military inspector court positions that he gets access to. Um, I can go through each one of them, but I'd rather just show you what each one does with a more advanced save so I can give you the exact details of each position. But he does have a limited amount of um, administrators that he has access to, so you won't be climbing through the ranks here and getting access to massive amount of administrators. You can see none of these positions say an additional administrator gained. So this one, the king, gives you two. There you go. I think, though, this is your first one. Oops. Nope. First one. Oh, there you go. Your first one starts at Duke. And that's just from the faction summary. So we're going to talk about a reform that will help you out with that real quick. Uh, but he does get access to White Horse Raiders and White Horse Fellows. These are mounted horse archers as well. And the military government uh, special building lines. So his whole... Focus is on a balanced military, um, but he also gets access to Zhao Yun. Now look how badass he looks. Mmm, light in the dark. So damn cool. Go ahead and do this. Delegate that task. As always, make sure you're actually fighting these fights. Don't delegate. Sure, whatever. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Then do that. If you guys don't have the Chinese voiceovers activated, you're missing out on just like a huge amount of immersion here. Um, I always pretty much occupy my very first one if I'm playing a, a, just a normal warlord that is not an outlaw. So, location for Gong Sun Zan is very advantageous. You're you're in the back corner here. So, really, what can you do? Well, I'd expand back this way and take this over. Um, it doesn't take you very long to do it anyway. I mean, he has access to these two locations, the town and the actual tool, ma tool maker. Um, I'd get access to the, uh, uh, the trade port to complete your commandery down here. And really the next logical step after that is Yu Zhao, because you want those horse pastures. Those horse pastures are going to be very strong for you. But your overall goal in this campaign is going to be knocking out Yuan Shuao as fast as possible. If you do not do that, he will steamroll you very quickly. Um, I believe the beta patch is activated, so Yuan Shuao does not get so bloated so fast from alliances and vassals. So take advantage of that beta patch. Uh, by the time you probably see this video, uh, hopefully the full patch will have come out. I have no idea. But that is my recommendation for Gong Sun Zan. He's got a very straightforward campaign. Take over this little piece and kind of make your back to the mountains here. Then just move south and take things. I mean, you could even leave <clears throat> Liu Yu to a later time just to get the drop on Yuan Shua before he gets out of control. Because you're going to deal with aggression from um, uh, Zheng Yan. Uh, not Zheng Jiang as much, but uh, Zheng Yan you're definitely going to get aggression from. Uh, especially as you get closer and closer through the commandery of Dai. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Um, but you have a lot of really cool abilities with Gong Sun Zan. So for one, his reinforcement range it gets a nice increase of 50%. Um, in addition, he gets 12% armor for all shock cav. I mean, he is a vanguard. That is kind of like his shtick. Um, reinforcement range is this this aura whenever you hover over something. 
That's the range in which something will reinforce you in a conflict, so you can look forward to having people by your side quickly and easily. Now, for he himself, obviously, he's going to be very strong as a Vanguard General leading shock cav charges. Um, he's got access to his fancy white horse raiders there. Here we go. Um, and they're pretty good in combat too, right? They're, they're a little bit of a dual role, not as much as, say, like a shock cav unit. I mean, when you compare them here, you can see that they win out against most of the raider cav as far as their damage dealt. But if you compare them to some of the more advanced shock cav, they're, they're definitely not going to win. But... Still, it's, it's worth mentioning how they're not that terrible in um, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So be mindful of that when you're when you're choosing these guys. You're not you're again getting a bit of a dual role character, uh, more on the archer side than than on the uh, than split down the middle, like a 60-40 kind of situation. But of course, uh, you get a lot of great benefits because he's got access to Roar of the Beast, which is a really cool debuff to morale. Um, Skill-wise, you're just going to want to do things that make the most sense for how you're building this character out. Um, I think immune to fatigue already starts with. Yeah, he does not start with that. So I would get immune to fatigue. Wherever that one is. Probably just melt. Oh god, where is it? There it is. Enables fatigue resistance. That's so huge. So, so, so huge. And that's for his own retinue. So as you fill this thing full of characters that you do want to have access to uh, lots of... I mean, because he's a vanguard, you're going to have access to a lot of shock cav. Um... They get immune to scare, disciplined, and scare itself, but they don't actually have immune to fatigue. I think the, the raiders might. No, the, the raiders do not. So, um, when you're taking these guys, make sure you're you're looking towards the fact that um, you're taking this skill line. Where is it? Aha. Fatigue resistance will help out all of your cav because then you'll have fatigue resistance and cav can get and suffer fatigue quite quickly because you're having them move around so much. So take advantage of that. Really focus on solidifying this back corner, pushing west and south, knocking out Yuan's trial as fast as possible. Again, just to reiterate that. Um, as far as your or court will go into in, in my, uh, my actual save, but as far as your reforms go, I would focus mainly on stuff that's going to give you a lot of cav bonuses and we'll talk about your your economy in just a second but this is going to be one of your main focuses eunuch secretaries this is going to give you your first administrator slot well above becoming a duke so get access to this fast because once you do that you can finally put an administrator in your first town um, in addition you get your military government which uh, gives you some nice bonuses here so the Baima Officer Headquarters gives you good prestige per turn, public order, starting rank for cab units, income from all sources, which is massive. Um, now, if you're having problems with, with uh, corruption, you can choose the Headquarters of Military Command, which is going to uh, reduce your corruption by 20%. So you're swapping out your starting rank per cab for corruption. Um, and honestly, this is probably going to be your go-to headquarters and military command is going to be probably a little bit more prevalent in your territories because this replaces um, your confusion line is going to be your public order your tax collection is going to be your income so this is going to replace that that chain of buildings that would reduce corruption so this is where you're going to get it from now as far as your economy goes taking a look here we get the trade port which is i believe commerce uh tool maker which is commerce horse pastures which is uh peasantry Fishing port, which is commerce. Iron mine, commerce. Do you guys see a trend? Do you see what I'm trying to talk about right now? It's going to be a lot of commerce. Um, I think this is spices right here. Yeah, this is spices right here, I believe. Um, and then this is another trade port right there as well. Kong Rong will, will snatch this up quickly. So don't depend upon it. But you've got another trade port right here as well. Um, as you push into the mountains... You know you're dealing with peasantry income all right here. Well, here we do this. This is easier. As you push in the mountains, this is all peasantry income right there. These three uh, territories. Actually, these four territories are all peasantry related. But your, like, your stronghold back here is pretty much all going to be commerce. So, stack the reforms that make the most sense for commerce. Look here. Uh, income from all sources. Peasantry. Industry. Well, that's, I'm sorry, industry. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, but still, this one does help. Getting to there for income from all sources is pretty good, in my opinion. Um, commerce one. So here's commerce industry. This one is commerce. 
Um, and this is where a lot of your actual access to your individual lines here. So artisan tools, industry, industry. Remember when I said toolmaker was commerce? I was wrong. So you're going to be, you're going to focus on these lines primarily because they're going to be giving you your bonuses to income or to your income bonuses to industry and commerce. I don't know why I thought the, um, the toolmaker was commerce. Made a mistake there. So apologize about that. But again, stack then you go into your state workshop. Oh, no, private workshop. Is that it? Yes. Private workshop is going to be the one that's going to increase your percentage income from commerce and industry, uh, depending on which one you're stacking here. Um, your labor one as well gives you population growth and income from industry. So in your trade port, in in uh, you uh, Ping, that really fast, so it didn't so it sounded like I knew what I was talking about. I would go with something like this, right? Master artisans for income uh, from commerce, or this one actually to be totally specific, master lacquerware artisans. But you get that 190 percent income from commerce. Um, stack it into the uh, fishing port and the trade port. That you'll uh, the trade port here that you'll be getting the fishing port you're going to get access to the same thing that's going to be commerce so stack that commerce and industry that you'll be getting through these two three commanderies over here now let's assume you do not knock out yuan shuao and he starts getting very strong very fast and he's pushing on you very heavily so i have a tactic you can use and i've only ever done it once St set sail leave this island go down all the way around here to around where taiwan is well taiwan um these marshlands for the most part are abandoned there's not even han empire here and there's a grip um i think this is uh, this is spices this is spices You've got a trade port right here uh this is livestock that's livestock um this is a tool maker or sorry, this is a tool maker. You've got so much action going on just right here in these little marshlands that if you expand to them, you, you'll be quite safe. You, your next opponent will be Sun Zhan, which will be like right over here. So um, if Yuan Shuao gets really, really hot and horny, do that. Um, as far as westernmost expansion, you will deal with a lot of aggression over here, and I'll show you in my save. Uh, you can expand all the way over to this location to get your horse pastures. Uh... I think it depends on how well your mountain campaign goes. If you have a lot of success with uh, Zhang Yan and Zheng Zheng, then do it. If not, don't worry about it. I didn't do it in mine. So let's jump over to my save so we can go through the court positions and talk about those a little bit to sum up uh, our, or finish off our little portion on Gong Sun Zan here. Okay, so here's my Duchy of Yan. Um, in this campaign, I actually, I beat Yuan Shuao to, into submission. <laughs> He's a vassal of mine. See? Your vassal. And... In my campaign, I got down to the river here, and again, I, I think you should really hold control of this portion of the Yellow River, especially right here. But I beat uh, Yuan Chuao into submission for the most part, and he has his little kind of small vassal state up in the hills across uh, the foothills in this portion over here. You can see I've kind of expanded quite well for myself. Um, I really, really liked this Gong Sun Zan campaign. I thought it was really fun. Uh, Zhang Zhang is still over here. She's got her, her whole little mountain stronghold still. Uh, we have Yan Men as well, though. So, my tongue is expanded all the way into the horse pastures. So, this is what this is what a turn 96 looks like. You can see the Duchy of Shu Han over here, which is really, really awesome. I, like, I love that, that, that you get to that whole kingdom stage of the game. Um, but, sorry. Let's take a look at that court position. So, you've got military, government, industrial, agricultural economic inspectors or and economic inspectors these progress up to chancellor grand commandant grand excellency grand director and grand tutor so how these all work is that they're bound to specific classes remember how the yellow turban had three of these uh, classes that would then progress upwards and they were bound to specific classes same thing with gong sun zan so when you take a look at the chancellor position um your military inspector can only be accessed by it'll tell you right there uh, only vanguard characters can be assigned to this post i, I thought it was a one-to-one -one translation upward it is not um so a, a, mil a government inspector does not become a grand commandant just so you know so government inspector is your commander industrial inspector is your uh sentinel agricultural inspector is it's i don't think i have one available here but it's it's a champion if that didn't make sense to you um it's usually about the color, right? An economic inspector is going to be our uh, strategists. 
Let me actually just summon one of these real quick so I can show you the benefits. Good. So military inspector. When I hover over this, it'll say the position effects are minus one construction time for military buildings, minus 15% recruitment cost. This is if he's the administrator of a commandery. So this is replacing your administrators and minus 30% corruption. Um, government inspectors. This guy's going to give us minus one to construction time for government buildings, 25% income from peasantry, 30% corruption reduction. Now, industrial inspector is going to give us construction time reduction for artisans, 25% income from industry, and 30% corruption reduction. So you're seeing a trend here, right? You're going to get a reduction in a building line. This is obvious. Ooh, holy crap. He's got so many general bonuses that it's going wild over here. Um, so he's going to give 100% food production, reduction to agricultural buildings, and then their, their corruption reduction. Man, he's got a lot of crap going here. Look at that. Then economic right here is construction time for learning in markets. Your blue lines, it's basically, they're going to reduce the construction time for any building line that they correspond with color-wise. Make it easier for you guys. And their 50% income from commerce, and then 30% corruption reduction. Your economic inspector should be your biggest focus, I would say, because it's going to give you a huge bonus to your uh, commerce income, which, as you've seen, is such a huge part of my income. Now, Chancellor is rele relegated to your uh, strategists as well. This is going to be income from peasantry. Actually, I believe these characters aren't... Oh, this, these are not locked. Yeah, these ones are not locked. These characters, you can just... Any character can, can choose them once you've unlocked it. I just realized these are the ones that you get... Um, by default. Um, as, as soon as you unlock them, anyone can fit into these roles. So you'll see here that this guy's going to give us trade influence and character experience. This one's going to give us uh, food from fishing, food from farming. This one gives us income from industry. This one gives us recruitment cost reduction. And this one gives us income from peasantry. So choose these inspectors that make the most sense for the kind of income you've got coming in. I mean, if you look at Yu Bing here, my commerce income is 693 right now. I could be stacking that more in the campaign, clearly. Um, but as you look around, you can see that, okay, my commerce income here is 100 and, there's 336. Peasantry is pretty damn high. Um, I stack a lot of peasantry. I don't remember what I was thinking during this part of the campaign. <laughs> but I stack a lot of peasantry in this location, and thus I have a lot of peasantry income. So then you would choose your court inspector that makes the most sense for that so agricultural inspector is going to give me an increase to my peasantry income in the commandery that they administer these are going to be administrators for you guys so hopefully that kind of helps you guys out when you're starting your gong sun zan campaign and you have a good idea now of how to use these inspectors as per the situations that make the most sense for your income for your commandery setup or how your empire is set to grow so hopefully you now have a better idea of what's going on and that sums things up here. Now you've got both of your outlaws taken care of. Gong Sun Zan as well, because we did not mention him. He kind of fits into this video though, right? He's right there next to uh, Zhang Yan and Zheng Xiang. So it kind of makes a lot of sense that he, he's incorporated with these two. Um, but mainly the focus, as always for these, is going to be choosing the buildings that make the most sense or the resources you have access to. In addition to that, being very aggressive with Zheng Jiang. You have the infamy resource that you have to really cultivate and grow. It's going to be very hard to begin with, but once you really get it going, it'll really grow for you. Now, in addition to that, with Zhang Yan, you do not have access to a special resource. Instead, you have ambush attacks, and you're a little bit more tucked away, so you have an easier start. That's why he's hard versus her being very hard. So, Hopefully this video has given you a really good idea on how to play either one of these outlaws or even the mighty Iron Fist General himself. If you have any questions, guys, as always, please feel free to let me know below and I'll, I'll answer them as best I can. But as always, have a good one and take care.